Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and a special welcome to all of our viewers via YouTube this evening. I'm Susan Donius, the Acting Executive for Legislative Archives, Presidential Libraries, and Museum Services. I also am the Director of the Office of Presidential Libraries. So it's a special treat for me to be here, given our topic of speaking with four very significant presidents. Tonight's program, An Evening with Mount Rushmore Presidents, is presented in partnership with the Lincoln Group of the District of Columbia, with support from Thomas Jefferson's Monticello and the Abraham Lincoln Association. Thank you to all of you for your support. To learn more about our programs here at the National Archives, please consult with our monthly calendar of events, which is available in the lobby, and you can also go online and register to receive that in, uh, information um, to your personal email. Another way to become more involved with the National Archives is to join our foundation. The foundation supports the work of our agency, especially its education and outreach programs. We have membership applications in the lobby, and you can also go online and join at archivesfoundation.org. Here at the National Archives, we preserve and make available the records of the United States government, including the records of the birth of our nation, specifically the Charters of Freedom. Our treasures also include records from the U.S. presidents, including Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Roosevelt, all featured on Mount Rushmore, and all four of who you will get to meet this evening. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the president of the Lincoln Group of D.C., Mr. John T. Elliff. John was elected president of the Lincoln Group of D.C. in 2016. He received his Ph.D. from Harvard and was an associate professor at Brandeis University. He also served for over 35 years in various government officials, official positions. John also writes and lectures on the life and times of Abraham Lincoln. Please join me in welcoming Mr. John Elliff. On behalf of the Lincoln Group of the District of Columbia, I want to thank uh, Susan Donius and uh, Susan Clifton of the National Archives, who worked with our vice presidents, uh, Karen Needles and John O'Brien, to bring this program uh, together tonight. Uh, I also want to uh, join uh, in extending our thanks to the Abraham Lincoln Association, based in Springfield, Illinois, and Thomas Jefferson's uh, Monticello, for their support of this program. Uh, in the lobby, you will uh, find brochures describing the Lincoln Group of DC. And if you want to find out about our uh, upcoming activities, uh, please go on uh, our website, uh, lincolngroup.org, and go to the calendar. Now I'd like to uh, say a word about our moderator tonight. Uh, our distinguished moderator is Harold Holzer. Mr. Holzer, through books, articles, public appearances, and interviews, is the country's most widely known authority on Abraham Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War era. He serves as the Jonathan F. Fanton Director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Center and Institute at Hunter College in New York City. Uh, he was recently named a distinguished visiting scholar for uh, Yeshiva University, Yeshiva. He is author, co-author, or editor of 52 books, including the winner of the Gilder Lehman uh, Lincoln Prize, Lincoln and the Power of the Press. My personal favorites of Harold's books uh, are Lincoln at Cooper Union, The Speech That Made Abraham Lincoln President, and Lincoln President-Elect, Abraham Lincoln and the Great Secession Winter, 1860-61. Mr. Holzer co-chaired the United States Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission appointed by President Clinton and received the National Humanities Medal from President George W. Bush. And he is the founding vice chair of the Lincoln Forum, which a number of us attend at Gettysburg in November each year. Now, it's time to meet the Mount Rushmore presidents.
Good evening, all. <laughs> Why do I feel we're going to have a hard time keeping Teddy in line this evening? <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Um, and thanks to Susan, the Susans, and to John Elif and uh, Karen Needles, and everyone who made this event possible. Um, it's a great way to start President's Day weekend, to precede it by getting together with the giants who dwell on Mount Rushmore. I must say, um, in a way, I feel a bit out of place this evening wearing such ordinary and drab clothing in front of our special onstage guests. So it's up to the audience now to suspend disbelief, transcend time, conflate history, and accept uh, not only the You Are There format for tonight's Back in Time reunion. How many people remember You Are There? Enough. All right. Um, there's something going on, and someone backstage needs to talk to. Is that? It's me. Right. Oh, I can live with that. OK. Um, this is where on C-SPAN they say, please turn the volume down on your television yeah, set. Yeah, right. exactly. They need to turn the volume down. So obviously, it's going to be a challenge. We're going to be spanning three centuries of history. But the common thread, something that never goes out of style, is leadership. The leadership that is required to create a nation, to wage a revolution, to write inspiring founding documents, to face down existential threats to our national existence, or to advance the presidency into the modern age. And during all of that, to speak words that stand the test of time. So let me just spend a minute more talking about my role tonight. Um, aside from trying to find some distinctions and common ground among our quartet of giants, um, I hope to do a little bit more than conduct the, the You Are There format that Edward Morrow did or Steve Allen in Meeting of the Minds. Not that there was anything wrong with them, goodness knows. Um, and we don't want to get back into the twilight zone, for sure. Um, so how do, I, how do I do this? And I've been talking to the organizers about that challenge. Well, I've written a great deal about journalists and journalism of the American past. So I thought the best option would be for me to combine the work of official greeter with that of slightly cantankerous journalists. So what I'm going to do is combine um, the unsurpassable Morrow approach with that of, say, James Callender, the journalist who Mr. Jefferson once urged to dig up dirt on John Adams, um, and as he may be aware later, turned the tables on him by spreading a story that we may get to later. I'll add a dose of Horace Greeley, the crusading 19th century New York Tribune editor who, despite so many aspirations in common with Mr. Lincoln, uh, turned on him more often than he supported him. And I don't know, I thought maybe I would also throw in a dose of Ida Tarbell, um, the muckraking heroine of the TR era, who also kept one eye on Lincoln as a historian while describing Roosevelt as the most ingenious an irascible character of the new century, the man who wanted to be a baby at every christening and a corpse at every funeral. <laughs> and the bride at every wedding. And the bride at every wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go as far as they did, but, um, um, and I will certainly accord you the dignity that I think all of you have earned through your service and the perpetuity you represent on that mountain we started with. So let me start with a kind of I guess a respectful softball of sorts. All four of you are enshrined on Mount Rushmore. In a phrase, what did you do to deserve the honor? What are the accomplishments that you think, obviously you don't know that you're enshrined, but I'm here to tell you that you are <laughs> as the quartet of giants. So what contribution do you think got you to the monument? And we'll start with the father of our country. Thank you for the question, sir. But I, I must say, I do not take any credit for anything that may have been achieved during my uh, administration or even prior during the war. It is, it is that uh, director of all things that our gratitude is due. 
not to myself. If I'm to be remembered for anything, I think it is simply for service to my nation, which the ancients, particularly Seneca tells us, is the greatest honor that any, any man may hope to achieve, is recognition for service to his country by his virtuous neighbors and countrymen. I'm rather astounded to think that uh, my likeness should be cut into the side of a mountain. Uh, perhaps it is because I reside upon one that someone thought that this might be useful <laughs> for posterity. Uh, but I've never cared for any sort of a monument to be made of me, or any likeness uh, uh, to be cut in stone or in statue form. Um, so therefore, I'm astounded. What did I do to achieve such a thing? Well, nothing more than what the people expected of me. Uh, that I was more or less one who, who tried to bring together our nation at a time of uh, great vitriol and political divisiveness, the election of 1800. Thank heaven, you never lived to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was my first effort, sir, to, to mend the nation and then to make certain we might have an opportunity to expand to the West. Uh, to commission, if you will, a military expedition to the west to, to see if there might be another water route that could uh, cut through the Stony Mountains and connect with the Great Western Ocean. And then, of course, we continued to be besieged by the Barbary pirates, and so they needed to, uh, well, to be taught a lesson. And uh, I found it necessary to retaliate. So uh, if all of those are to receive the further approbation uh, of the people and the ages to come, well, then I... I suppose, thank you. <laughs> I'll defer to uh, Mr. Lincoln before I answer. The chronology you'll keep. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, down here to my right, Harold, is my beau ideal, my boyhood hero, General Washington, father of our country. And all honor to Jefferson whose words I borrowed enough times that the folks now reading books and magazines and hearing Blu-ray <laughs> are claiming they're my words. But I'll put the record straight. They're Jefferson's words. And what the that old house divided in a divided time in our country's past. Drove us to hostile camps where men were arguing whether lands west of the Missouri River should be slave or free. And so they, that great emancipator, that rail splitter, old Abe, <laughs> didn't care for much of that. But it seemed to me that my view of democracy was when, and when a fella would work for the sweat on his brow and not be able to eat the bread of his labor. In my opinion, that was not democracy. <laughs> and so if Borglum in his thinking said I had something to do with keeping it together and that all men are created equal, then I'll be happy with that. Uh, if I may, Mr. Holter, uh, I'm the only man here that knew Gutsum Borglum. He was a dear friend of mine. Uh, we used to chat into the late hours at the White House while his son Lincoln, named for you, <laughs> would fall asleep. I said that Lincoln Borglum was the only man brave enough to fall asleep in the presence of the President of the United States. Uh, uh, this, of course, was years before Borglum's design of Mount Rushmore, but he indeed says that uh, President Washington is there as the father of the country. Jefferson for Western expansion, Lincoln for emancipation, and me for the square deal. Uh, that was uh, the representation of my domestic policy. Uh, but I'll take this opportunity as well. You mentioned Ida Tarbell and the muckraking press. Uh, do you know whence that phrase? Does anyone anymore read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? Second best-selling book in the United States in the 19th century, long forgotten, my father's nickname. Great Heart came from Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And you'll remember that uh, uh, Great Heart, leading Christian and the other pilgrims, one of the places past which they uh, 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 travel is the place with the men with the muckrakes in their hands. Men so busy raking up the muck and mire of human existence, they fail to look up and see salvation right before them. 
that when I coined the phrase the muckraking press, I was not playing a, a paying a compliment uh, to the yellow journalists of the day. <laughs> I think, I think you've suggested, you've skimmed a little bit over your friendship with Borglum, but maybe we'll just <laughs> leave it there. So in this pantheon, I think you've been very forthright um, about your accomplishments and, and quite modest. And um, I think what each of you has not dealt with yet, and you certainly deserve to, are the great words that you've created, the, 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 the founding documents, the, the Constitution, the Declaration. And of all of those words, whether you wrote them, drafted them, rephrased them, brought them into the 20th century, um, presided over the convention that, that, that enshrined them, what of all of the tenets that were created, particularly by you, Mr. Jefferson, but known by all of us, what is the principal founding tenet that is the most crucial in your time, and then we will take it as wisdom for ours. I wish I could say that uh, it, it is the words that all men are created equal, but that is not my new or original thought. In fact, everything in our Declaration of American Independence has already been written. It has already been argued. It has already been debated. You may find it in the elementary books of public right, the works of Aristotle and Cicero, Algernon Sidney, John Locke. Uh, it was my charge and the charge of the committee appointed by President Hancock not to come up with anything new, but rather to reiterate, resuscitate the wisdom of the past in clear and simple terms so that everyone might understand it, an expression, if you will, of the American mind to be comprehended by the diversity uh, of our population, our greatest strength. If there's anything new or original founded upon the wisdom of the past, I think it is the the very last sentence of our declaration, uh, that in support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Is it not the first time in human history that a people have come together upon the principle of compromise and resolution? on behalf of the common good. That, sir, was secured in that fan final line that we showed the rest of the world, let alone the monarchy of Great Britain, that though we were 13 individual nations, each one distant, disparate from one and the other, in the degree of religious opinion in one versus the difference in another, the degree of freeholders in one versus the greater number of tenants upon the freeholdings of another, that we were able to bring them together e pluribus unum, to compromise and resolution not only for our general safety and defense, but for the common good. I think that uh, is the novel element of our declaration. And, and let us not forget those principles. General, would you, uh, would you like to comment on the words that you most relied on? If I may exclude the, the, the divine words, words from um, American secular scripture that you relied on as you created the office of the president. I, I will tell you, sir, I think our system of government is perhaps the most brilliant that has been achieved by man. Our, our constitution, it is not perfect. There is no man amongst the 56 of us who were engaged in its creation who think it perfect, I believe. Uh, there's a number of important principles and tenets, none the least of which are, are the checks and balances upon one another, that a, a branch of government not step upon the others, but I think that the most important of all of our political principles and customs is that ability to amend mm -hmm. our systems of government, that we might make what alterations may be necessary to improve or to repair what error that we may have by mistake uh, placed within the document. We must, however, be mindful that just as with any other human institution, that time and experience are just as necessary for the determination of the usefulness of governments and constitutions. We must never enter into this alteration and change just simply for a want of innovation or novelty. Beautifully spoken. I dare say, Your Excellency, I've never gotten over the compliment you paid me that our declaration is our promise and uh, that indeed our constitution is the guarantee. Mr. Lincoln, what words did you live by in your youth and your rise and, and in the, the terrible days when that union started fracturing? Those fellas, they're talking about the promise and some 
87 years or four score and seven years. <laughs> I, I use that to monopolize in that address, that promise that those fellows were talking about, that out of the conflict, the failure to see compromise, which drew swords. And, and some years prior to that, that whole issue of Douglas and I in Illinois, slavery was the question and the expansion to the West. But the question over and over and over was what did the founding fathers mean in that constitutional document? When it was written, all men are created equal. That was the nub of the case in the debates. And then when we took up arms against one another, we could tell, were we to tell a defeated South or victorious North and the, the question of the outcome was unable to be determined in 63. But by the amendment process, the last best hope of earth for democracy, that document allowed us to amend that we could finally as a country say, what it meant when it was written, all men are created equal, endowed with inalienable rights, those being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It took a war, but the bloodshed allowed us to move forward as one nation under God. Mr. Roosevelt. I'm a bit in awe, of course, uh, to be here amongst uh, these brilliant men. Uh, and uh, my hero, uh, who I wrote, was uh, the Ovid, or Homer, of, Ameri of American letters. Uh, I wrote some 30 books. I did not write well. I simply took well to writing. <laughs> but when I think of uh, the words that are an inspiration, I look to the good book. I myself said that uh, a thorough knowledge of the Bible was worth more than a college education. You know the emergency circumstances under which I took the oath of office in Buffalo in 1901. I did so in a private residence in a borrowed suit of clothes without <coughs> a Bible at hand. In 1905, when I took the oath of office in my own right, no longer an accidental president, come to the presidency through the graveyard. And with today's news conference, I must admit, I, I did win by the largest electoral vote and popular vote <laughs> plurality in our history uh, uh, in that, uh, to that date. But when I uh, held my right hand aloft with a ring given to me that morning by my Secretary of State, who'd served as your private secretary, young John Hay, inside a locket of that ring, a clipping of Abraham Lincoln's hair, my left hand on the Roosevelt family Bible, open to and my left hand upon James 1.22. Be thou not only hearers of the word, but doers of the word also. The verses go on to say that doing the word means caring for the, uh, for the elderly, the sick, the infirm, those in prison, the hungry. Well, I knew no man who lived the gospel better than my father, Theodore Roosevelt, the man for whom I named. And when I was your president, I knew that we could not be a great nation unless we were a good nation for all of our citizens. And it was the inspiration of the gospel that made me uh, work as hard as I did in the executive office of the United States. Just a follow-up question, Please. Mr. Roosevelt. You, you must have had a, a fascinating upbringing in terms of your view of the war that nearly destroyed the union that these gentlemen created. Your mother, I believe, was a rather ardent uh, secessionist. Your father was uh, almost in the Union service. Of course, he did buy himself substitution there. But he was certainly a pro-Lincoln Republican. So how did you get to the point where you wore Lincoln's hair in your ring? Were you, I know you, 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 you lost your mother, and it was a great tragedy. Surely you respected her views as well. How did you sort all that out? Well, uh, you may know that when I was a little boy, uh, fully dedicated to the cause of the Union, I was born in 1858. Uh, of course, I was uh, in New York City during the terrible race riots of 1863. 
Uh, but my mother once overheard me uh, after she'd uh, disciplined me during the day. Uh, my evening prayers, I was praying that the good Lord would grind the southern armies into dust. <laughs> when my father returned from his duties, having been appointed by President Lincoln to be a, an allotment commissioner and a sanitary commissioner for the Union cause, uh, my father came home and told me never to say such a prayer again. For, of course, I was praying against the uh, best interests of my mother's family. Uh, uh, President Lincoln would remember that my mother's half-brother, uh, James Dunwoody Bullock, was the head of the Confederate Secret Service in Europe, and in Liverpool built the CSS Alabama and the CSS Shenandoah, uh, great raiders that did uh, uh, terrible damage to American commerce. Uh, I used to campaign in the South uh, bragging that I was half Georgian, half Southerner, it never did me any good no. in an election. Uh, uh, the South then was entirely democratic, and I was a Yankee from New York City, a Republican. Uh, two, two faults and you lose the point in tennis. But uh, I was able to uh, realize that part of my uh, life and part of my administration, especially when we went off to fight in Cuba for Cuba Libre, well, it was the Spanish-American War that brought the gray and the blue together beneath the red, white, and blue. And uh, being a part of the healing of the country was uh, certainly a major dynamic in my own lifetime. I think you've described your own house divided rather well. There you are, sir. Right. So, um, Mr. Jefferson, you, you famously said, if I could not go to heaven but with a political party, I would not go to heaven at all. I paraphrased a bit there. Um, yet, I must say, and and... Our audience and your moderator live in fractious times. I must credit you because the two-party system seems to be rather your invention. Um, yes, look at your... your... <laughs> now, as the first American Secretary of State, you serve in the Washington administration, but as you say, the the 1796 election, which, which President Washington witnessed in the 1800 election, were rather, were rather difficult. So were you right or wrong to create a two-party system in America? And Mr. Washington, <laughs> I'd like to hear your views, too. Well, I, it, it depends how it continues. I, I would... Um, <laughs> I would uh, rather than not be simply two parties, I'd rather say three, four, however many the people uh, would care to uh, support and to provide for the free expression of their opinion. Uh, how is our constitution to grow? <laughs> uh, with amendment to correct things that uh, are erroneous. Uh, uh, and there are, as you know, Your Excellency, you live to see me suffer a consequence of something that is written in our Constitution. Whoever receives the second highest number of votes then becomes vice president. And so I had to suffer that office for four years. <laughs> Do you know the mind of man never conjured up a more useless office than that of vice president? <laughs> I had absolutely nothing to do. Well, Do you know what I'm talking speak. about? Right. I see. Well, I said I would rather be a history professor than be vice president. There you are. <laughs> so that needed correction. And, uh, and rest you assured, it, it was corrected. Our 12th Amendment, 1804, uh, there at the, the dawn of my uh, second uh, or third presidential campaign, but the second uh, uh, opportunity in the office. Yes, Mr. Holzer, I, I think it is necessary to have the opinions of the people properly expressed uh, through political platforms. Uh, I think it uh, is uh, erroneous to suggest that everyone be of the same mind in matters of politics. Good heavens, I learned from Mr. Wythe, under whom I read law for a good three years in, in Williamsburg, if everybody is thinking the same thing, uh, then somebody is not thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and why he's talking about uh, opinions, Harold, my Wednesdays were my public opinion baths. So we can campaign, but then somebody's going to have to sit in that chair and listen. And folks would criticize me, and they'd say, Lincoln, why are you spending all this time listening to the people on those Wednesdays? I said, they are the people. They must be heard. So you write about the campaign, but then 
once election's over, you better have somebody in the chair that's got an ear to hear. But Mr. Lincoln, I must say, not to be critical, because you know I really like you a lot. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but <laughs> you were a Whig, an ardent Whig, an ardent anti-Jacksonian. You were a Republican. You were rather happy, as I recall, in 1860 when the Democratic Party, the heirs to Mr. Jefferson's party, split in two. And now you're emphasizing your public opinion baths. I must say, you're a pretty good party man. You like political parties. Did it go, did political party animus go too far? Isn't that the problem that you faced when you arrived in Washington in 61? Well, the, the issue was when you come to the office with less than 50% of the vote, it, it allows folks to line up and throw bigger rocks at you. So, um, have I got stuff to tell you backstage? <laughs> <laughs> but, but the, the Whig party all but winked out after the Jackson banking policies become, become moot. And we had that issue coming forward of what the expansion would, would mean territorially or once they had a constitution and moved into statehood. And like Mr. Jefferson, you helped create a party. Exactly. Well, then, if you were a Jacksonian, Mr. Lincoln, you did go too far. <laughs> <laughs> the difficulty is not one of a difference of opinion. In a free nation, difference of opinion is not a crime. It's what gives that free nation its strength. It's not by some accident that both Mr. Jefferson's and Mr. Hamilton served in my cabinet of secretaries. But to be guided by principles of faction, whether that faction be the wealthy against the poor, or the north against the south, or the east against the west, or the, the farmer against the manufacturer, it should be avoided. You're and right. the alternating domination of one political party over another, spurred on by the spirit of revenge, will always drive a nation further and further from its better interests and greater counsels. It causes a man to be a servant merely to a political party and not to his nation. Your Excellency, we have discussed this before. There's been correspondence between us. We were a faction. We were a faction. <laughs> we had to be heard. We had to bring together, if you will, 13 individual nations. That is what Great Britain thought ought never to happen, and that is what provided the success of our revolution, along with the French. You can say much more of the French. Well, if I can get Mr. Roosevelt in here, because you became unhappy with a political party, as I recall, in 1912. You may have to explain it in some detail for, for your predecessors. That's all right. I've brought them up to speed at oh, Mount good, Rushmore. Good. Oh, good. We've, we've really got nothing to do when we're up there all day and all night, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you simply created, your, you walked across the street after the Republican convention of I, 1912, literally walked across the street and created your own political party. Of course, uh, uh, chairman of the Republican convention, Elihu Root of New York City, uh, we marched out of that convention shouting, thou shalt not steal, thou, sh thou shalt not steal. It was about a fortnight uh, before our return as the Progressive Party convention. And of course, we had a platform. Uh, it uh, included women's suffrage, unlike the two major parties that year. But when I returned from hunting in Africa with Kermit and touring Europe, when I toured the country with Pinchot, who himself had been fired by uh, President Taft, well, I discovered that President Taft had returned my Republican Party and our federal government back over to those men that I called the malefactors of great wealth, the special interests on Wall Street. And so I broke with my Republican Party and uh, launched that progressive campaign. Some say that our platform actually was the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. And uh, there was some tough campaigning between my old friend, William Howard Taft, and myself. Uh, uh, politics has always been hard, but imagine, there's no excuse. I called my old friend, Will Taft, a pudding head <laughs> and a puzzle wit. Uh, I'm uh, glad that the party came back together. I went uh, to sleep uh, election night, 1916, thinking that my Friday night speech at Cooper Union had done the trick, uh, that uh, we would wake up to have Charles Evans Hughes as the president-elect, but uh, it was not to be. I came back to the Republican fold in great part because across these now 50 states, 
the election laws are written for the benefit and the sustenance of the two major parties, not for the development of any successful third party campaign. Uh, and, and you gave us something. I just want to give you full credit for your accomplishments tonight. You did give us the presidential primary, <laughs> for which we owe you so much. <laughs> Well, I won eight of the 12 Republican primaries uh, in 1912. Mm -hmm. I beat Taft in his home state of Ohio. I think he beat you in your he home state of New York. He beat me in New York. York. I wasn't yet out of the gate. <laughs> I was going to let that lay where it was, Mr. Holzer. <laughs> but uh, of course, uh, uh, you realize that uh, when the uh, nomination was stolen by the Republican bosses at Chicago, well, anyone from the land of Lincoln knows it's not the first nor the last time that something politically was stolen in Chicago. <laughs> Well, let, let, all of you have touched on the right of the people to express themselves, to uh, then come together harmoniously, to work together for the, for the greater good. And I'm struck again by something that Mr. Jefferson said. Whenever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. Um, how do you balance um, democracy looking at your own time and perhaps a little bit looking forward because you've had these conversations on the mountain. <laughs> How do you balance democracy with the responsibility to know what you're voting for? How do you produce the educated electorate? Because as you may know, um, we're having a challenge now about participation, about full participation, about getting everyone the right to vote, which you, you, you both may not have envisioned. But th what is that balance? The question was addressed to you, sir. <laughs> you were the first. <laughs> we, um, when we met together in Philadelphia and penned our uh, Constitution, sir, we did not create a democracy. We quite purposely created a republic, sir. Uh, the, uh, a democracy is the degenerate form of a republic. We, we purposely avoided that. There are um, three branches of our government. One portion of that branch consists of two separate parts, so four portions of our government. Every one of those portions of that, and by this I mean the general government, the federal government, every portion of that government is chosen by a different means and to serve for a different length of time. Only one body uh, in our day was created by a general election whatsoever, and that was the lower house of the legislature. That, Congress, the House of Representatives, uh, the, that's why they're called that. They are the representative branch of government, and they therefore must be holden to the people, correct? The Congress, uh, the upper house, the Senate, was chosen by different means. Those means chosen by each individual of the states, uh, 13 when we first adopted the Constitution. In most cases, it was their state legislators who elected their Senate. The president, of course, is elected by an electoral college. The Electoral College is the same number of men that are sent to the full Congress, so the Senate and the House rep representatives together. It cannot be any of those same men. And they must use, they have two votes, one of which must be used for a candidate from outside of their state. The man who has the highest number of electoral votes is elected president. I had the honor of having uh, been elected unanimously twice. And the man who comes in second is, as has already been stated, is the um, vice president. And then the last remaining branch of government, the, uh, the least important, the weakest of them, the judiciary, <laughs> is um, appointed by the president with the consent of the Senate. This isn't by some accident. I, I should also mention they all serve for different lengths of time. And this speaks to what I said earlier. Our system of government allows for change. But for that change to occur, it must hold the majority of the people's intentions, and it must hold it for a long period of time. It, that way we are not affected by demagogues or we do not see alterations in our systems of law because of passing fancy. It must maintain the will of the people, the majority of the people, for a long time. That, I think, is one of the brilliances of our system of government. Mr. Holzer, I'm, I'm very curious to hear the opinions of the gentlemen who have followed us, but uh, this has ever been a point of argumentation between His Excellency and myself. Uh, I will not deny that we have made a successful effort to create a republic, but it, it must announce properly the voice of the people. And in order for that to, to secede, it must be more of a democratical 
republic. Now, I rarely use the word democracy, but I cannot deny that, that there is no more pure form of a democracy than a New England town meeting, where the people are able to, able to gather and express their opinions freely, uh, to argue and debate, and then to come together through compromise for the general good. This the essence of the ancient Greek states and, and their opportunity to argue and debate, a democratic form of government. So what it implies then is the opportunity for the government to keep a pace with the people, and the more so when the people are properly informed. Absolutely. To educate the people is the true success for a democratic republic in its perpetuation, in its improvement, its betterment. Ignorance is not bliss. An educated citizen body will always be a self and well, a safe and well defended citizen body. And that we are in complete agreement, sir. And it is through my limited education, sir, and I'm surprised that you did not think of it, you being <laughs> better educated than myself, but Plato warns us that a republic is destroyed when it becomes too democratic. Precisely, but I'd rather an honest heart than a knowing mind. <laughs> and so therefore, well, what helps us better to understand an honest heart, to understand the pursuit of truth, than education and the enlightenment of the citizen body, to better understand uh, the requisites and the responsibilities to hold the reins of government, very much like a farmer who tills the soil, holds the reins to provide for his sustenance, the sustenance of his family, the community, the nation, the world. And so therefore, I, I do believe that uh, if we can achieve someday a, a universal system of education, as you know, Your Excellency, Absolutely. this has been my desire since June of 79, when I submitted bill number 79 to the Virginia House of Delegates in Williamsburg, Virginia, for the general diffusion of knowledge, and of all of the other bills that have succeeded for religious liberty to end the importation of slaves to Virginia, to end primogenitor and entail, 79 has not passed as yet. I may never live to see a one-room schoolhouse in Virginia. Mr. Lincoln, you, 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 have, you came out quite early for universal education, but in terms of direct democracy, I'm reminded that not once but twice you were denied election to the United States Senate by a vote of the state legislature. In the second of those contests, your party arguably won more popular votes than your, uh, uh, than, than your opponent who, who won in the legislature. And then as, as president, you supported the most extraordinarily lax immigration laws to encourage new citizens to vote. Hear, hear. Is that, is that, was, was that a result of your disappointment in the process through which you were denied the Senate seat? Well, yeah, I think it's, let me, let me talk about education. I think, Education is the most important topic that we can be involved in for it's that, that child that's going to rise up and take over our institutions, our churches, and our governments. The future is in his hands. And so as we welcome new, new people to our, our shores, it made sense for them to be enfranchised. And, and if they happen to be German-speaking, then, and then maybe they ought to have a German paper available to them to listen to the issues of the day. And if they think Lincoln ought to be their candidate, then, then maybe that's all right. <laughs> Did you have the same view when it concerned... Irish immigrants who, I believe, voted about 80% Democratic. Well, if we could have been more successful had the Irish only voted once. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Roosevelt, education and democracy. I come from a certain bias myself. I was homeschooled. I did later in my life say that uh, Access to a good public park was important uh, in a city as, as access to a good public school. And especially with those that had come from other countries, uh, the opportunity to educate them with regards to the heritage of this country and the duties of citizenship, not simply its rights. Uh, now, I went on and had a bit of formal education at Harvard College. <laughs> Today, Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts, I do assure the audience, I did not learn much of practical value at Harvard. 
most of my classmates majored in the issue of nightlife across the Charles River in Boston. But we do have fine schools and fine teachers. Uh, we've developed uh, probably the best tertiary education system uh, in the world. But I am concerned about what's going on in the schools, in the cities. Uh, so very often, children that face violence on the way to or from school, that are beset by gangs and drugs and that sort of uh, dynamic, and yet we send them off to a school where over 50% of uh, those young men of African American or Hispanic heritage are dropping out of our public school systems. So it's just a reminder to me that with regards to education, the duty belongs not simply to the school superintendent, nor to the teacher, nor to the principal. The responsibility belongs to each and every one of us, not only those with students in school. The duties of citizenship include caring for the young children in your community that are attending your public and your private schools. And uh, the highest office in the land is not president, it is citizen. Mm. And so I ask each and every one of you that uh, as you leave this evening, uh, when we conclude, rededicate yourselves to the duties of citizenship and perhaps even become involved in the provision of education to the local students that live in your area. Become a mentor, become a reader, a volunteer at your school. Uh, I was a volunteer in Cuba. They were shooting at me. Volunteer your schools, and perhaps we'll all be more pleased with the results of our public schools. Beautifully put, Mr. Roosevelt, although I think you may inadvertently have committed a faux pas. Mr. Lincoln, who is largely self-educated, worked very hard to get his son into Harvard <laughs> University. <laughs> a little bit about your schooling. I think we should hear about your education. It was uh, a letter from Stephen Douglas that Bob took with him to that school. And it was Stephen Douglas that introduced Bob to Harvard. That's how we pronounce it. No, no. <laughs> Harvard. Uh, my education, I remember as a representative in that lower house, we had to fill out a questionnaire, if you will, and uh, got down, to, they, they wanted to know so they could print it, and they had the word education. I could only think of one word, defective. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't, have, uh, we didn't have the blab schools out in Illinois uh, when I was growing up in Indiana and uh, they'd ring a bell if the school marm was present in that one room and if the bell wasn't rung you stayed home and did chores and in that part of the West a, a learned person would, would come, and, and if a lear learned person would move, they had books. And we didn't have a, a library of sorts, you, you borrowed it private. And in the unforeseen circumstance, that book could get damaged, then you was obligated to work off the price. And, uh, and that's how that worked, and Mentor Graham who I learned much from. You, you, you mentioned mentoring. That was important to me, and to be a, a help. And if, if you didn't know all your numbers and letters, you found a learned person who could help you with them. And we learned our letters and, and ciphering to the rule of three. And I'm hoping they're still doing that. <laughs> but that was my defective education. And I remember your saying in uh, Trenton that one of those books that got damaged was Parson Weems' book about that gentleman to your right. The Life of Washington. Parson Weems? I hardly know the man. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first rule of American biography. You didn't have to know your subject that well. Like, like yourself, Mr. Lincoln, I suffer a deficiency of education. And no one understands the importance of education as much as those of us who have been denied it. I agree with you fully, Mr. Jefferson, regarding uh, your Act 79. I, I wish that Virginia had adopted it. But too many men refused. Too many Virginians were against adopting a public education. 
They thought it were too dear. They thought it were too great a price. But in a free society, it is of great importance that your citizen be enlightened. I dare say that the want of an education is a far greater expense. It is true. And, and simply to enlighten them generally, provide a, a general system of education, enlighten the people generally, and superstitions of body and mind will take flight like evil spirits at the dawn of day. And that was my view in emancipation, Harold, to allow the, that teaching to a, an enslaved people who are now free so that they could understand the scripture, read it for themselves. And, and other learned works. It made sense of the betterment of our, our country, and especially those states in the South as they come back into the Union. That ain't all Virginia was against. <laughs> <laughs> Pregnant pause. Well, you, you brought up this subject, and we really ought to spend a bit of time on it. Um, you gentlemen may not know that we mark the month of February not only by celebrating the birthdays of our first and our 16th presidents, but we also mark it by uh, observing what is called Black History Month. Now, it's a difficult subject. Um, all of you have an, uh, a sort of a... a, a checkered history in your attitudes toward the citizen or the non-citizen of color. Um, President Washington um, liberated many slaves at his passing, and, and yet there is a new book out 200 years after uh, the experience that describes your relentless pursuit of one of your servants who ran away in Philadelphia. And I believe the, the, the record shows, sir, that you pursued her until the year of your passing. You may not know you passed, but in 1799, <laughs> you were still pursuing this enslaved person. Mr. Jefferson, what can I say? Are um, you, um, your rhetoric brilliantly describes um, freedom, and yet, even though you thought at the beginning of your national career that slavery would end, you seem to become more determined at the end to make sure it was sustained. I will get to the two later presidents later. May we start with the founders? Are, are you a married man, sir? Yes, sir. I, um, I should begin by mentioning that the, uh, the person that you're speaking of, so wrongfully uh, seduced away from her uh, master's side, was my wife's slave, not my own. Um, she, at least at, the, at that time, called herself Oni Judge. I know not what she may call herself now. I should begin, perhaps, by mentioning that I have very purposely avoided any discussion regarding this subject publicly. I don't mean Oni Judge. I mean regarding the possession of uh, slaves. And I've done so in an attempt to avoid what I am disappointed to learn tonight wasn't avoided. And that is a challenge to our union. Shortly after we adopted our uh, Constitution and as our nation begun, a number of states begun to take actions to end slavery within their own bounds. But they did not all do so with equal order or regularity. Pennsylvania comes to mind immediately. Pennsylvania decided willy-nilly that all slaves within its place would be freed without any concern of their present circumstances or education. Now, of course, when the act was first adopted, that was prior to the Constitution, and an exception was made for the Congress. Their slaves were not affected because they weren't, in truth, residents of Pennsylvania. Then uh, we adopted the Constitution, a new system of government was created, and our government met in New York, as you mentioned earlier. Shortly thereafter, for two years, we met in Philadelphia again, and I assume that same provision that we're allowing the uh, possession of those people to the uh, Congress would be extended to the rest of the government. It was not. I think a much wiser counsel than simply offering freedom to slaves willy-nilly was what Massachusetts done. Massachusetts did not alter the circumstances of any current slaves. What they did, they eased their own manumission laws, so it was now possible to free slaves, which had been prohibited the people of Massachusetts earlier. 
And they stated that from henceforth, all children born to those slave parents would be born free. But they didn't simply cast those people adrift who had not been raised to care for themselves. Now, to the subject, I'll tell you this. It, I have endeavored to avoid speaking in the matter publicly, but I think now, now that I've passed, it can do little harm. You will never meet a man more in hopes of a general manumission or freeing of all the slaves than myself. But it must be done slowly, and it must be nearly imperceptible, and these men must be brought to a level of education necessary that they might be able to live as free members of a free society. I had thought that that were coming about on its own. I am disappointed to learn tonight that it did not. And it is not without further effort, Your Excellency. I'm in complete agreement with you. And, uh, and I ask citizens, indeed, how can we, as we have already heard discussed, provide a system of education for the enslaved when we have not a system of education for the American citizen provided? Uh, universal in the regard to understand that this onerous practice cannot but continue to, to make us fall into arrears. The support of a system of labor that doubles itself with every generation, while indeed the labor force continues to kill the soil and the cultivation of that weed of infinite wretchedness. I am speaking tobacco. And yet, when we thought, when we thought in time that this would simply pass by, that people would well understand to engage a wage-earning economy provides indeed the payment of a wage for any degree of labor that may then be spent, particularly in the company store, provide an incentive accordingly. But what happened? It's all resuscitation of slavery, a reinvigoration of it. And that, if you will, is something that I complied, though we hardly had the knowledge at the time, within the very First patents, as I presided as head of the patent department, I signed into commission Mr. Whitney's invention, the cotton gin. I wonder how that has progressed along the Mississippi to the Delta. And I wish, with what might be there for a future prosperity in such cultivation and yet a, a further enslavement, I wish that I could could simply unshackle myself of this, and yet, no, my people are no longer my property. They're the property of my creditors. They are in tail. I have only two ways out. I can sell them, meet the demands of my creditors, and is that what I am to do? It does not end it. Or I, I can hope to resuscitate the productivity of my plantations, let alone my mansion house. I built a nailery. It is operated by the enslaved young boys. I'm hopeful as they sell nails at market, as they receive the remuneration, that they might make some monies to perhaps, if I die insolvent, purchase their liberty from my creditors. But we're all caught. We're all bound. And I'm wondering now, if we are to achieve a, a universal emancipation in our nation, I ask you, my fellow citizens, can we live together under the same government? That preoccupies us, Mr. Monroe, Mr. Madison as well, the, the idea of a deportation colony in the Africas. No, we have not remained silent upon the subject. When I was elected to my first public office, 26 years of age, the Virginia House of Burgesses under the old regime, my very first action, do any of you know of it? I hope it may not be forgot, was to stand in that body and second, a motion made by Mr. Bland, Richard Bland, to begin a debate, merely to begin the discussion and argument and debate towards ending the importation of slaves. We were trounced. I was asked to be seated. Who is this upstart from the wilderness? Who is this turncoat unto his own class? <laughs> well, I never let him down, did I? <laughs> but at the end of your administration, the international slave trade was abolished. One thank of your you, unsung achievements. Forty years later, I thank Mr. Holtz for reminding us of that because it was written into our Constitution, yes, was it not, that we would provide another opportunity 
and I'm referring to the one that I engaged, instigated initially in our Congress, then seated in Annapolis, the spring of 17 and 84, my report on the Northwest Territories. How might we carve out new states of these territories that if we had won uh, in our war? Five requisites, mind you, that every territory becoming a state will forever remain a state of our union. Secondly, every territory becoming a state will have its government in Republican forms as the other state and the federal government. Uh, thirdly, uh, every territory becoming a state will have a poor portion of the national debt apportioned on it as it can afford to pay. No need for a national bank. <laughs> and, and then, <laughs> fourthly, no one holding a hereditary title will be admitted a citizen of the United States. But fifthly to the question, Mr. Olson, by the year 1800 of the Christian era, there shall no longer be any involuntary servitude in any of the states or the territories annexed to it. Are you familiar with this, Mr. Lincoln? My report on the Northwest Territories, it was put up to vote, and it lost, citizens, it lost by one vote. It was said the delegate from New Jersey was home ill that day. Politics as usual, Mr. Roosevelt. That evening I wrote, the heavens clouded over our young nation and the destinies of unborn millions was made. So yes, Mr. Holzer, we had another opportunity, 1808 and succeeded, sir, perhaps because our old enemy, England, succeeded in ending the importation of slaves to her shores through the efforts of Mr. Wilberforce, with whom I continued to correspond. Well, I would like to bring this, our Black History Month discussion to our 19th and 20th century presidents as well. And I will do a, a prelude for each, which I hope you don't find disobliging. Mr. Lincoln, you managed to progress in your attitudes from uh, uh, that of a lawyer who was willing to take on a case uh, defending the owner of a fugitive slave. I'll explain the fugitive slave business later. Oh, I'm um, with oh yeah, well, it's enshrined long after you, you left us, but um, to a uh, person who, uh, as a candidate for the Senate, spoke frankly about what you perceive to be the limits of equality to a president who not only signed what you called the greatest act of the 19th century and one that f liberated a race, in your words, someone who made sure that was enshrined in law in, in the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. A long journey, which I'd like to talk to you about. And then, I will, then I'll pose a question to you, Mr. Roosevelt, because Mr. Lincoln, has quite a story to tell. It was on that flat boat to New Orleans with speed. We got to the Ohio and I had seen them shackled together and it tormented me. And as I said to Speed in that letter, it has tormented me ever since. And I came to right here in Washington City as a congressman and prescribed the freedom of those enslaved individuals right here in Washington City. And the party back home said after my single term when I should have been running for re-election, they said, time for you to stay home. We're going to give that congressional seat to somebody else. Because that's how the party worked in those days. And my time was up. And I got back into the practice of law and was making a, a good wage as a, an attorney back in Illinois. But then Senator Douglas, Senator Douglas prescribed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And he said uh, that constitutions could be determined by a uh, territorial government before the statehood could be developed, which meant that institution could come out of the boundaries of 36 degrees, 30 minutes. And I had the taste in my mouth about politics like I'd never had it before. 
And then the question of what did the document mean when it said all men are created equal? And what did it mean to a country if that peculiar institution could spread from the Atlantic to the Pacific? And it was a political quandary. And there sat the most powerful man in the Senate of the United States, Stephen Douglas, for uh, Calhoun, Clay and Webster were all dead. He absorbed the power of all of them. And as the Committee on Territories chairman, could decide how those states would come in. And it seemed to me that we were ready for that new political party. And the, the colonization question, should we recolonize? came to my administration as president, and I was visited on a number of occasions by Frederick Douglass. And I broached that topic with him. And he said, these folks was born here. You can't send them away. And I disposed of that idea. But the question in the debates with Senator Douglas, what did the Constitution mean? And it was a slow evolution. We just couldn't have immediate emancipation. The country wasn't ready for it. But by 63, when we'd been at war for several years, the opportunity presented itself because Britain and France had already outlawed slavery and they were being courted by the South to come in on their side. But we were on the world stage. And if they were to come in, they'd look like hypocrites. For they had already dispensed with that peculiar institution on their territory. And you could hear from this very location the Confederate artillery firing. And some folks was of a notion that the Confederate armies were ready to march on Washington City. And so as a war powers act, a preliminary emancipation was discussed as late as September 62. But we bring that forward on January the 1st of 63 that folks currently held in states under rebellion shall be free. But the critics said, see Lincoln, you're slow on the emancipation question. But the record shows I may have been slow, but I never walked backwards. <laughs> and that brought us then those final victories in the fall of 64, before the election, and the Union soldiers voted three to one for the election, re-election of the administration. Although in August it looked questionable, they were in the fight to stay. And we stayed. And allowed us then to consider an amendment, gentlemen, to that Constitution that we could then, as a people, determine what direction we would head. And in January 65, indeed, Illinois was the first state to ratify that amendment. So even out in the West, they was thinking, those Western men. So that about sums it up, Harold. I one of the great tragedies is, you probably don't know this because your life ended a few months before, but the amendment was ratified in the December after your passing. And uh, um, one of the ironies, the sad ironies of history is that you missed that final, that final triumph. I think we'll end this part of the discussion with, uh, with uh, Mr. Roosevelt. But he, uh, I, that instrument that you're holding does not have to be passed to the right. I will explain that to you later as well. Um, um, 
Mr. It's Rose all right. Uh, the more we politicians have learned to amplify our voices, the less we have to say of any merit. <laughs> <laughs> so, in the, in the period between Mr. Lincoln and yourself, a long 35 years of, of history, the country made strides with additional constitutional amendments that guaranteed citizenship and equality and civil rights and, and voting rights, and then regressed uh, tragically on the year of the centennial of the independence about which Mr. Jefferson wrote so brilliantly and General fought so bravely. Um, by your period in office, it was almost a second wave of indentitude and other horrors that came close to approaching slavery in many ways. And yet you made some extraordinary advances in just the way you behaved, the people you welcomed to the White House. And I remember you welcomed uh, a former slave named Booker T. Washington to lunch with you at the White House. Someone get a fan for Mr. Jefferson. Um, it, it really happened in the White House. <laughs> well, I, I might remind you, of course, that I provided the opportunity uh, for a, a Mr. Banneker to, to take on being a, uh, a surveyor for the federal city. Yes. I've, and uh, I believe one of the very first to come into the capacity for providing that of his race. And, and this is providing us the recognition of the necessity to lift these people uh, to a, a platform upon which they, we may look at them with the rest of mankind, the family of man. So, yes. Mr. Roosevelt, uh, I initiated the same thing. Point taken, Mr. Jefferson. And I, uh, <laughs> but tell us about Booker T. Washington. I and walk I must... in the heritage of these men who played the ball where it lay in their time. We do an injustice to the history of this country if you uh, attempt to judge any of the men here uh, through your modern uh, sensitivities and your knowledge. Uh, we were all stuck in the time in which we were. And we had to play the ball where it lay. I myself, it predates Booker T. Washington. When I was but 25 years old, making my first appearance at the Republican National Convention, along with a, a young politician from Massachusetts, Henry Cabot Lodge, we led the effort to defeat Senator Blaine of Maine. And uh, I nominated, I made the nominating speech of Congressman John Lynch of Mississippi, a former slave. And when he was successfully elected, he became the first temporary chairman of a great party convention, this in 1884. Uh, prior to becoming your president, I briefly served as the uh, governor of the Empire State. Uh, well, in New York, uh, I can tell you that in Rochester in 1899, I dedicated a memorial. And I know who Frederick Douglass was. <laughs> The memorial stands there today. And in my remarks as governor, I said that there are those who walk in the footsteps of Frederick Douglass, and that one was the Wizard of Tuskegee, the president of Tuskegee University, Booker T. Washington. And when I invited him to luncheon at the White House, we'd spent the day working on Southern issues of education and labor. And when I myself realized that I briefly hesitated to invite him, as I would invite any gentleman to dinner that night, well, I was ashamed of myself. It was but weeks after I became your president, I knew what I was doing. And of course, Senator Tillman and other racist Democrats of the South, Senator Tillman said uh, there would be a thousand lynchings of Negro men in the South for the action that I took in having mm -hmm. Booker T. Washington as a lunch guest. I would hunt in Mississippi in 1902. The origin of your wonderful toy, the teddy bear, is a story of hunting with Holt Collier a former slave, a body master to his servant. In my lifetime, I swear to you, I never met a man and judged him by his race, color, creed, religion. You know a person's character by his actions. By his actions, Booker T. Washington had shown himself the equal of any American man. We could speak on so many issues for so much longer this evening, but I know you have to get back up to the mountain. <laughs> um, Mr. Washington, Mr. Jefferson, you probably can't imagine this, but the last few years of, in the world of culture and entertainment have been focused on a Broadway musical in which you both play a very prominent role. 
I know General Washington was quite a, a, a devotee of the theater. Um, uh, it's, and and um, Mr. Roosevelt, there have been musicals and films. Films I'll discuss with you later as well. And uh, Mr. President, uh, there's this fellow named Daniel Day Lewis, but it's a long <laughs> story, a very long story. And by the way, uh, uh, an English gentleman named Cary Grant once slid down your faces. Um, and it was uh, uh, Alfred Hitchcock. Again, it takes a lot to explain the intervening 200 well, years. I, I prefer that over arsenic and old lace. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> Another Charge. Cary Grant vehicle, yes, I believe. Yes, that's right. Very good. <laughs> but um, I would say that with all the amusements that continue to enshrine and, and expand our knowledge and appreciation for what you've done. Um, we, in the midst of any challenge we faced from the past to the present, thanks to your wisdom, your instruction, and your leadership, we remain one nation indivis indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And we are not only blessed that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt lived among us, but led us with, some, with such wisdom and such uh, patience. Hear, hear. We, <laughs> and I somehow knew you'd be the first to <laughs> endorse them. During President's Week, we're, relate, we're reminded of what the real president, what the real national debt is. The real national debt is to the founding and sustaining leaders who forged, defined, preserved, defended and strengthened the nation. We do thank them, and we thank Ron Carnegie, our George Washington, Bill Barker, our Thomas Jefferson, George Buss, our Abraham Lincoln, and Joe Wiegand, our Theodore Rose. Bullet. How about, how about one quote to end the proceedings? And I'm going to surprise you because I'm going to pick a 1910 quote from Theodore Roosevelt. It is of little use for us to pay lip loyalty to the mighty men of the past unless we sincerely endeavor to apply to the problems of the present precisely the qualities which, in other cases, enabled the men of that day to meet those crises. Bully. Bully, well said. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>